And before we begin, I want you to, let's once again, as we do, uh, read together this affirmation. Just read this with me. In the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we stand upon the living Word of God, ready to receive its truth, be transformed by its power, and faithful embody its teaching in our lives. Amen. So we are talking about apologia, a faith worth defending. And my goal is to give you some, some keys and some help whenever you're confronted with providing proof for why you go to church all the time, why you're always reading the Bible. Now, I know you don't need to be convinced, uh, well, most of you, because you're here today and you come every single week. But there are people in your family who are not convinced. And whilst you may be an enthusiast and even a fanatic, a fan at it, I'm a fan of Jesus, you may need to explain to people why you're so excited. And oftentimes we are caught off guard because people are asking us for evidence for why, why we believe. And so our foundational text, as we've been reading, um, and if you, have a piece of, if you have a pen and piece of paper, take notes, because the time will come when somebody will ask you these questions, and you'll be wondering what did pastor say. Our foundational text is 1 Peter 3.15, and says, but sanctify the Lord in the Lord God in your heart, sanctify the Lord in your heart, and always be ready to give a defense. And we've said and established that the word defense is apologia. Always ready to give an apologia to, any, to, to everyone who asks you why, you, why are you, why are you so hopeful? Why do you go to church? Always be ready to give a rational answer. And also with meekness and with fear. So let's take a, just a quick recap. So in week one, we talked about what exactly is apologetics and why should we be involved. And we said two things. One, because we sanctify the Lord in our hearts. Jesus is precious to us. When anything that is precious to you is being defamed or uh, misrepresented, if the person is precious to you, you want to give a defense. Amen? Yeah. Um, and also because it's commanded of the Lord. The Bible says, always be ready to give a defense. And so we talked about in week two, proof for the existence of God. Now, how many of you uh, were here for that message? Now, those of you, how many of you were here for that message? I'm sure there were more than two people who were here. Now, uh, if you weren't here, go online and listen to that message. It's gonna, it will help you. When people ask you, give me proof for the existence of God. Last week, Dr. Renee Brathwaite was talking about theodicy, the problem of evil and a good God. And I listened to that, and you had a wonderful time. Now, today, I want to talk to you about the indisputable evidence for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Indisputable. Look at somebody and say, indisputable. indisputable. Now, first of all, we have to talk about this because there are still some people who have a veneer of intelligence who believe that, uh, the, that Jesus... Uh, as an historical figure, was only a myth. You know, people like Bruno Bauer, and uh, who this uh, well-respected German theologian, can you believe it, who doesn't actually be believe that Jesus existed. You've got Bernard Russell, you've got Richard Carrier, uh, and these are all influential people who don't actually believe that Jesus existed. And so the question we, we are posed with is that I know you love the Lord. I know you praise God and you go to church and you worship an invisible Christ and you worship an invisible God. You read your Bible. But can the existence of Jesus be proven? Can it stand the empirical test that we are required to give in the 21st century? That's a question before us. Now, when anyone asks you, uh, if anybody asks you, prove to me that Jesus existed, and they will. 
oftentimes, just like they say to you, uh, prove to them that, that God exists. Prove to them that Jesus exists. And when they ever ask you that question, normally when they ask you that question, you must ask them, and write this down, what type of proof are you looking for? Because oftentimes people, they say that to close you down. Ask them, what kind of proof are you looking for? You may even ask them, prove to me that George Washington existed. How many of you know that George Washington was just a myth? <laughs> Is it proof to me that George Washington existed? Well, well um, things that he wrote. Okay. He signed the, the Constitution, 1780. Come on, two. 1776. Then... We also know that there are people around him. They had Madison. You, you, you had uh, Benjamin Franklin. These were people who were his contemporaries. Um, you had other things taking place around the right the same time. The, you had, you had the, the French Revolution a few years later. Uh, so, so there are historical events. You have things that he, maybe notes that he has taken, maybe things that he has written down. People who have spoken about him. You got people like Phyllis Wheatley, Wheatley, who was around an African American woman. But what did she say about that time? Was it King George the Third? Was it? Uh, um, what was made? What was the time that that he was around that could, could corroborate his existence? And so, this is the only way you can prove it. You cannot say, "Well, actually, he's coming around for dinner today." You can meet him personally. The people who were around that knew him, his family, they're all dead. So how can you, what kind of proof do you want? And oftentimes when people ask you for the proof to me that Jesus existed, they do not give you the, the, the privilege of, of measuring the kind of proof that they want from you that in the same way they, they measure proof for everything else. And that is, you only have documents, you only have what people say, you have primary and secondary sources in order to, to prove. So that's the first thing you must ask. When you're talking about proof, is what we call the comparison and corroboration. Multiple attestation. So that means, uh, it, it, and this is the important thing because Islam, for example, has only, only has one attestation, only one person saying one thing about what God says. Came out of the cave and said, no one else could corroborate. No one else was in the cave. Now, I love my Muslim brothers, but what I'm trying to say to you is that the Christianity has multiple attestations, what Jesus was saying. There were people from different parts of the world. There were uh, pe people in the family, for example. James, his own brother, didn't believe until Jesus rose from the dead. And so there are multiple ways that we can attest. And we have to look at primary sources and secondary sources and even hostile testimonies. Now, uh, we want to ensure that when people ask you that you can give a rational response. Now, I know I'm not going to get an amen today, but if you can say that you learned something as I teach this lesson. Okay, number one, the fact of Jesus' historical existence. Did Jesus actually exist? And not more than that, can you prove it? Now, when you... When people ask you to prove the existence of Christ, the first thing you need to understand is that there are a number of different ways of proving. First of all, you have non-biblical. They may say, well, you cannot just quote the Bible. The Bible cannot justify itself. I'm going to come to that in a little while. But there are non-biblical evidence that proved and talked about Jesus. Jesus wasn't just something that happened uh, and the gospel and the miracles in a small place that nobody was around. There are non-biblical evidence that attest to 
the historicity of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you a few of those. First of all, there's Plavius Cornelius Tacitus. Now, remember him. Now, I'm going to ask you to remember two people. It doesn't be a number of names, but just remember this one. You can quote to someone when they ask you this. Ask them, didn't you know that Tacitus testified about Jesus' existence? Now, these are people who have no interest in Jesus. They don't care whether he called himself the Savior they don't care. They, and many of them were even hostile to him. And so what we have here, this, and this is important because uh, Tacitus was a well-respected historian. And he prided himself on being, and not being prejudiced. Now, Christus, he says, from whom the name at his origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius. Now, when you read Luke, it tells you it was the reign of Tiberius when Jesus was crucified. The multiple attestation. It's not, it's not just made up. You can tie down the crucifixion of Jesus. And thank God that when Luke and others were giving these historical events, they were naming people during the reign of this time, during the reign. And why? Because these things actually happened. And Tiberius, at the hand of Tiberius, and Pontius Pilate. The Bible says the same thing. Now, these, the fact of Jesus' death, in this case, uh, is, 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 is talked about and attested in these non-biblical um, sources. Now, for example, Lucius Samasta, uh, Samasata, Samasata, somebody say that. <laughs> Someone might, don't say that, you might, you might want to you might think you're, you're speaking in tongues, all right? So, now, he says that, again, he was a man that was very hostile to Christianity. He said, the Christians worship a man, personage whom introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. And oftentimes, when they are saying these things, they're not under the anointing. They're making jokes or they're giving facts. For example, Tranquilius says the Jews, a Rome, uh, a, 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 a cause continuous disturbance at the instigation of Christus. Again, he's talking about a particular Jew. The second person I want you to remember is this person, Pliny the Younger Historian. Write his name down, if it's not in your notes. Christians sing responsibly a hymn to Christ as to a God. Now again, these are people who have no interest in Christ. But you can see here that they are already giving testimony that the early Christians were worshipping Christ as God. Do you know that your enemy can testify? Hallelujah. Some of you don't understand what I'm talking about. But God will cause your enemy to testify of his goodness. Now, and so they're also, these are, these are Greco, Greco-Roman sources, but they're also Jewish sources. I want you to remember this name, write this person's name. If you don't remember anybody else's name, when it comes to this, remember Josephus. Because Josephus was a, a, an historian that was prolific. In fact, he wrote the history of the Jews from the Genesis all the way to this present time, his present time. He was well known as an historian. When you read about, when you read the Maccabean Wars and everything else, the Jewish Wars, Josephus was the authority who wrote about these, uh, wrote these historical events. Now, he says that Jewish Josephus mentions Jesus twice in his works. Antiquitous. <clears throat> he described Jesus as a wise teacher, a miracle worker, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, while the authenticity of the passage, uh, you can forget about the last bit. But um, uh, again, Josephus, uh, you can read, Google him and look it up, but you can find out that Josephus, who was a Jew, a historian attested on a number of occasions in his works about the historicity of Jesus Christ. Now, that may not be something that you need 
But somebody that you may know need to understand that Jesus and his existence is an historical fact just as George Washington's existence and anybody else in history is a fact. You've got the Syrian, the Stoic philosopher, Marabar Serapion, who wrote a letter to his son complaining or comparing Jesus to other wise figures who were persecuted for their teaching. And so you have multiple individuals attesting to the, uh, the historical fact that Jesus was an historical figure. You have the Babylonian Talmud. Now, the Babylonian Talmud are the writings of Jewish rabbis. Whenever Jesus said, you have heard it said, most of the time he's referring to the sayings from the Babylonian Talmud, meaning that these uh, commentators and commentaries by these rabbis were written down as secondary sources. These, uh, and, and so they were, they were copious and voluminous comments about, from rabbis who have given commentary on text, given commentary on law and everything else. An extensive collection of sayings, teaching and viewpoints from ancient Jewish rabbis. And within the Babylonian text, I don't have time to go through it, but there are multiple places where they talk about Jesus in this non-Christian text, they are talking about Jesus Christ and uh, the reality of what took place in the first century. You can look up that. And so you have people like uh, Flavius Josephus, you have Suetonius, Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, and many others. And when you look at the whole picture, you can see from Pliny, from Suetonius, from Celsus and Josephus, the Talmud, Phalius, you can look through the whole way and the whole gamut of history, there are multiple sources of non-Christian, um, non-Christian sources that talk about Jesus. So, take a deep breath. So that we got that out of the way, right? No. So what about the biblical evidence? Now, the Bible is one of the greatest evidence for the historical fact of Jesus. Now, the Bible is not like the Quran or any other book. It's not one book. It's 66 books. Amen. Amen. 66 different books written by different writers at different times, in different locations, under different circumstances, in different cultures, in different seasons, and all kinds of things are happening in these periods, and every single one of them are pointing to Jesus Christ. I'm talking about from Italy. I'm talking about from, from places like uh, Egypt and all around the world. They're talking about the same thing. Did you know that there are three 300 prophecies that point directly to Jesus. God has given us all, not only did Jesus, God say, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to allow Jesus to come into the world, but I'm going to give you 300 prophecies that will, to, to give you, a, God is trying to help us here. He's trying to say, look, I'm going to give you 300 prophecies that would say, tell, tell you exactly when, exactly where, exactly why, exactly how he's going to die, he's going to raise, where he's going to be born, where he's going to die, who he's going to be with, and all. And I'm going to give them thousands of years in advance. And so the Bible itself, the 66 different books, over many periods of time, it's a unique book because it all points to Jesus. Yes. Now, you may be one book today, but these are 66 different books. Twelve disciples. Now, if you're going to ask whether Jesus existed, who are the people around him? You're going to ask, and now nobody asks when they, when they hear about George Washington or Caesar, uh, when they read it in history, when they hear other people corroborating his contemporaries talking about him, other people writing about him in the papers and all kinds of things, nobody questions their testimony. They were there. 
Sometimes it makes you wonder whether you think the people in ancient times were idiots. They had nothing to do but make up stories about Jesus and spend their entire life telling a lie. Twelve disciples told you in detail about Jesus. You have the synoptic gospels where you have four individuals giving you eyewitness testimony about Jesus. Time would not allow me to talk about the apostle Paul who was hostile to Christianity to begin with. Persecuting the Christians. And who said, now I'm a believer. So let me put this to you. No thoughtful person will deny Jesus' historical existence. The evidence is too overwhelming. So, now that we, we come to the point that, that you would have to kiss your brains goodbye and, and not believe in empirical evidence if you're going to say that Jesus did not exist. It's widely accepted. But... Did he really die on the cross? Okay, Jesus existed. It was a good Jew. But none of these other stuff are, are, are true. All right, and so let's look at the fact of Jesus' crucifixion. Is it, and I want to say to you that Jesus is, I know that he saved you, and you love him for the fact that he died for your sin. But did you know also that the crucifixion it's not just a spiritual reality, it's a factual reality. The crucifixion is an historical fact of history, in the same way you would measure any other fact. Again, you've got this great historian, meticulous and scientific in his deliberations. And, in, and when you read that, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it is lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works. Again, whether you believe it or not, that they understood that Jesus was doing miracles. When people ask you, these people who were uh, around thousands, hundreds of years ago, believed that Jesus was doing a teacher for, uh, of such men as received the truth with pleasure, he drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was Christ. Now, this person is not a Christian. He's not a Christian. And when, when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at that time, at the first, did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day as a divine prophet and foretold these things, foretold these and 10,000 others wonderful things concerning him. Now, what I'm saying here is that you have people who are corroborating the events that took place that we talk about in the Bible, but they're not in the scripture. These are historical events. And you have, for example, again, Tacitus, consequently to get rid of the, the, the report, he talks about how Nero blamed the Jews, but he said, Christus, from whom the name I had read before, at his origin, suffered extreme penalty of crucifixion. So the crucifixion of Jesus is an historical event. Let me move quickly. Uh, You've got the, the most skeptical New Testament scholars, uh, all confirmed that many of them don't believe in, in the miracles, don't believe in the virgin birth, but all of these, even liberal scholars, right, that read the scriptures and study the Bible, they all attest to the fact that Jesus died on the cross. You got people like Gerd Lodeman, and I don't have time to go through these. You got Dominic Croson, who is an uh, infamous person that talks about Jesus uh, not being God and everything else. But all of these people agree that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Marcus Paul, Jesus' execution is the most certain fact of the historical Jesus. Now, he don't believe much, but even he, as a scholar, believed that Jesus died. Uh, and you got the Jewish scholar 
who talks about Jesus' death by crucifixion is historically certain. You've got uh, many others. You have Bart Heyman, a strong critique of Christianity. One of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman um, prefect. And so the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth is a fact of history, not just because it's in the Bible, because, but, but history, documentation, sources that are external to the Bible all corroborate to the historicity of the crucifixion of Jesus. Now somebody give God praise for that. Amen. So the fact of Jesus' history, for example, and let's talk about that. The, the, first of all, how can we know for sure that Jesus actually rose from the dead? People are going to ask you that. I believe all that stuff, but the resurrection is a myth. First of all, we, had, we have the, the fact of the eyewitness testimony. Now, who would suffer and die for a lie? you got all of these disciples. Some are sawn into two. Some are burnt at a stake, fed to lions. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had, if I had lied and it came down to a lie or me being hit, eaten by lions, I would say, hey, yeah, we made it up. <laughs> you know, we, me and the guys, we just thought it would be a good idea. We just made it. No. All of them but John died. They died because something happened. They died because they encountered something. People that were stabbed with the sword. People that were, uh, that were, that, that were uh, killed by, by lions. And all, some put in hot water. And, and Peter who was crucified upside down because he thought he wasn't worthy. All of that to corroborate that Jesus Christ actually resurrected from the dead. He rose from the dead, and these ordinary men were so convinced that bar one, every single one of them died because of what they believed. Somebody would have broke ranks. Also, the, you have people that say that the whole thing is a hoax. Now, if you're going to make up a hoax in, and you're going to plan a big scheme to pretend that Jesus rose from the dead, the last thing you would do in those early periods is to choose a poor peasant woman as your primary witness. Because the witnesses of women didn't count much. The early testimonies of women in the four gospels postulate that the story was not invented. Who would invent? Now, if I'm going to make up a story, you better believe I'm not going to make up the fact that I deny Jesus. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to, somebody said, let's make up a story. And in that story, we're going to put in there that at Jesus' final hour, you ran for your life, you denied him, right. and you escaped. You said, no, 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 that's not going to be the story. No. We stayed with him and we, we suffered with him and we defended him. Right. Nobody would include the embarrassing Evidence that is in the scriptures. Deserted. Denial. By the dis disciples. The reason why they are there is because they actually happened. You have the fact of the empty tomb. When you're thinking about, we know Jesus existed now. We know that he was crucified, historical evidence. Now, did he rise, raise from the dead? We know factually that we were told that they were given orders by the king. And remember, by this time, the disciples are scattered, scared out of their wits, hiding in the upper room. The Roman soldiers were told by the, the emperor that we know that they said Jesus is going to rise from the dead. So he put a battalion of soldiers to guard the tomb. And to make it even firmer, he put the Roman seal across the tomb. That if anybody breaks that seal. Now can you imagine? You've got a battalion of soldiers guarding the tomb. You've got the Roman seal 
sealing the tomb. Can you imagine those scared disciples that ran for their lives somehow got the courage to defeat all of the Roman soldiers and to remove the seal? It's preposterous. What really happened is that something happened in that empty tomb. Glory to God. I don't know where those, where, where those soldiers went, but I can imagine while those soldiers were, were standing guard, they heard something happening in the background. Something was moving in the graveyard. Holy glory to God. Something was moving in a place where dead folks should not move. I don't know what is going on in there, but nothing should be moving inside the gravestone, inside the graveyard, because there's only a dead man inside there. They were looking for the, um, the power and the, the, the offense to come from the outside, but there was something happening on the inside. There was something moving on the inside somebody said I hear a noise I hear something moving on the inside and when they looked around they saw the rope, the stone that was was uh, placed in front of the, the cave began to move aside they must have seen angels they must have seen the lightning flash they must have seen the glory of God because this historical event must have had heavenly attention and when they I, where were the soldiers they ran for their lives. <laughs> Hallelujah. Take God's pilot answered. Go and make the tomb as secure as possible. Thank God for Jesus. And the fact of the resurrection, post resurrection appearances, Jesus appeared. To hundreds of people. Hundreds of people. Many of them were alive when the gospel were being written down. You couldn't make it up because the people would say, I was there. That didn't happen. I was there. Jesus never, we never saw Jesus again after the resurrection, after his, his, his burial. That's a lie. I saw him in the market. There was a commotion somewhere and I was, I was buying some tomatoes, tomatoes, and I looked across there. I said, well, what in the world? What you know? I saw him there. He was the same Jesus. I know his mama. I know his papa. I know James. I know his brother John. And I can tell you that was Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he was alive. What can I tell you? Our faith stands on facts. It stands on empirical evidence. And the greatest evidence of all is that one day I was lost. I was looking for hope. I tried things in the world to bring me satisfaction. And one day I walked into a church and I heard somebody talking about Jesus. I didn't know much about him. But I heard that he can save sinners. I heard that he can bring hope to broken lives. I heard that he can bring purpose to lives which are meaningless. And that day I came to the altar and I gave my life to Jesus. And ever since then I was born again. My life has changed. And that Jesus that was alive many years ago is only not only alive then, but is alive now in my life. That Jesus Christ is a living Savior. Jesus Christ my greatest testimony is not the witness of the angels. My greatest testimony is not the scientific evidence. My greatest evidence is not the eyewitnesses evidence. My greatest evidence is because Jesus is alive in my life. Hallelujah. And if there was no other evidence, if there was no scientific proof, if there was no corroboration, if there was no multiple attestation, the fact that Jesus Jesus is in my life today is all the evidence I need. He woke me up this morning. He started me on my way. He gives me hope. He gives me a song. When I'm down, he picks me up. Somebody needs to give the Lord praise right now for his glory. 
Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Somebody stand to your feet and proclaim to the loudest of your voice that Jesus is alive. He's alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's alive. He's alive from Egypt to South Africa. He's alive from East, from Australia, all the way across to the United States. There are people all over the world who are Indian and Pakistanis and Iraqis and Australian and New Zealand and Europeans and Africans, all are giving Jesus praise. 2.2 billion people are the witness that Jesus Christ is alive. Bow your heads. The witness of Christ's existence is evidence in this church. He's alive. Hallelujah. He's alive. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, bow your heads. I don't know Jesus. And you want me to pray with you? Just raise your hands. Is there one person here today? Pastor, I want to give Jesus a try. I want every Christian to be praying at this time. will save you. He will heal you. Is there one person today I can pray with? The pastor, pray for me. Pray for me. Hallelujah. I want everybody just to pray that if there's somebody here, maybe you've backslidden, maybe you've lost your way, but you want Jesus to come into your life, just show me your hands. I want to pray with you. Don't be afraid. I won't even call you out if you don't need me. We don't want to come. I just want to know who you are. I can pray for you. Is there anybody here? I'm not a Christian, Pastor. I go to church, but I'm not born again. Is there one person here? Hallelujah. Is there anybody I can pray with? I don't want to be here today talking about the history of Jesus. You are here lost. You don't know him. Jesus can save you, can change your life. Jesus can make a difference in your life if you give him a try. And I'll just one more time. Is there one hand here? I can pray with anybody. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Just put up your hands high. Let me see your hand. see that hand. Masha Kataya. Handara Masha. Jesus is alive. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you for that hand. We pray that you will touch that individual. You breathe upon them. Hallelujah. My second prayer today, you may be a Christian, but you, you want to be closer to God. You've been slipping. Things have not been going the way you want them to go. I said, Pastor, help me. I want to get back to where I used to be in my faith. Just put up your hands. I want to pray with you. Thank you for your hands. Thank you for your hands. Father, I pray for those who have raised their hands. And I ask you to bless them. I'm going to ask the, work, the prayer team to come out just in case they want to pray. I'm going to ask those of you who raise your hands. Just take a few minutes. I know it's Mother's Day. Take a few minutes after this we've dismissed. Come to the altar and allow the prayer team to pray with you. 
Hallelujah. And so, Father, we thank you today and we praise you for your goodness. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and just sing us out with that song, He is Alive. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The rest of us, just lift up your hands to God and just give him the worship and the praise that he deserves. We thank you, Father. We thank you. We praise and adore you. I'm going to ask those of you who raise your hands to come out right now. Those of you who raise your hands, those of you who want prayer, you want prayer today. Don't leave this sanctuary when there are people here who wanted to pray for you. Just take a few moments to allow us to pray with you. And so, may the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ rest, remain, and abide with us all now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.